it's great to see everyone. Welcome uh, to today's webinar. The whole child policy uh, table is presenting investing resources equitably and efficiently. I am Linda Darling Hammond, president of the Learning Policy Institute. I'm joined by Dan Thatcher, my colleague at the National Conference of State Legislators, and a brilliant panel that he will introduce to you shortly. Uh, we'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors, which include NCSL, as well as AASA, the School Superintendents Association, and the Sold Alliance. Uh, this webinar is the fifth in our six-part series on transforming state education policy through a whole child approach. If this is your first time joining us, you'll see here the other webinars in the series, and you can view the videos through the link in the chat. I'd also like to extend our appreciation to the Carnegie Corporation of New York, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Harmony and Inspire at National University, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and Pure Edge Incorporated and the Wallace Foundation for supporting the whole child work featured in this webinar series. We'd also like to thank the funders of our work on school finance, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Rakes Foundation, and the Yellow Chair Foundation. Today, uh, we're going to be exploring how states can invest resources equitably and efficiently for whole child learning. Uh, and I'm going to uh, ask to get the um, cursor handed to me. There I go. I see that I can now control the slides. Um, let's see how if it's working. Um, and we're going to talk about how money matters. We'll be digging deeper into some of the research and policy strategies described in the interactive whole child policy toolkit. You can find the toolkit at the link in the chat. I'd like to thank our partners uh, in the whole child policy table for helping to identify the resources and policy examples described there. We encourage you to explore the toolkit. Uh, and I'll be launching this conversation with an overview of what we found from many years of research on how resource investments can support school uh, productivity and student learning. Uh, we need to start with some appreciation for the current realities in the United States. We do have the largest economic disparity since 1929. The top 1% of the population controls 10 times more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population combined. We have growing segregation and concentrated poverty, high rates of childhood poverty, food and housing insecurity in the most vulnerable communities. We have teacher shortages. A lot of students who are opting out of school uh, challenges now with chronic absenteeism not only associated with uh, opting out or um, being feeling lost in the system, but also with issues of um, ongoing um, illness, uh, not only the COVID-19 virus, but RSV and other things that children are experiencing, pandemic effects on the health and mental health of young people, and a lot of disruption to the status quo. So that's kind of where we are at this moment. We do have the highest uh, poverty rates in the industrialized world in the United States for children. Uh, and those uh, are, children are increasingly concentrated in specific districts and they're in schools that are increasingly segregated. Uh, in this context, only about 12 states spend at least 10% more on high poverty districts than low poverty districts. Most states, uh, spend less on children in high poverty districts, even though the districts need to meet a greater number of needs for those children. When we think about the anatomy of inequality, uh, we really start with that poverty and segregation. Uh, we tend to layer on that unequal school resources in many states. That leads to an inequitable distribution of well-qualified teachers. We find that um, high minority districts and schools uh, and high poverty schools have uh, three or four times as many underprepared teachers as those in um, low poverty uh, environments. That then contributes to unequal access to high quality curriculum and to uh, dysfunctional schools ultimately. Uh, when we think about what it means to uh, lack uh, a sufficient supply of well-prepared teachers, that also then is associated with many of the challenges we find in school. Poorly organized instruction, not enough supports and scaffolds to help students learn the material. Exclusionary discipline is associated with underprepared teachers. Uh, heterogeneous classes 
which could help us avoid some tracking, are harder to teach. They require more skills. So the reinforcement of tracking uh, accompanies that. And then quite often students' social and emotional needs are not understood. If you add to that implicit bias that is common amongst all of us in this country, uh, that can sometimes lead to assumptions that students are incapable, that families don't care. It can reinforce harsh discriminatory treatment, and it can activate stereotype threat, which is the feeling that any of us has when our, uh, identities that we hold are stigmatized in society. And that can be as a function of race or ethnicity or language or immigration status or um, special education status, any number of things. Uh, and teachers need to be able to understand how to dispel those anxieties and concerns that impede performance. What we know about what boosts achievement, we have quite a long uh, history of research in a number of these areas, uh, many decades of research. We find that, in fact, school finance reforms that increase funding for low-income students do improve educational attainment, later employment and wages at very significant levels. We've seen that in multiple studies across the country in many, many states. High quality preschool, we know, boosts achievement. We know that having fully experienced, uh, fully certified and experienced teachers and those who have national board certification, which is an expert um, designation uh, for those who've demonstrated those skills, actually have a greater effect on student learning gains than race and parent education combined. But teachers with those features are disproportionately allocated to more advantaged students. We know that uh, from recent studies, having a black teacher for even one year significantly increases achievement and graduation and college going for black students. And there are now a number of studies showing the particular supports that black teachers uh, are providing for black students. We know that social emotional supports and restorative practices improve achievement, graduation and mental health and reduce achievement and discipline gaps. And we know that community schools which provide wraparound services mental health, health services, social services, as well as a very personalized approach to working with children and families also improve uh, attendance, achievement, and graduation rates. So when we think about how to spend money, we need to be thinking not only about the amount of money and the formula that allocates it, but also the um, degree to which the um, money is spent on those things that really make a difference. Uh, the research really leads us to a whole child approach where we can aim resources at people needs, uh, where we can put in place a 21st century curriculum with the kinds of assessments that are focused on the higher order skills and problem solving that we need in this age uh, that is supported by skilled teachers and leaders. Uh, by the wraparound supports that many children need to be in school, able to uh, concentrate uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, by early childhood education. Uh, when we think about community schools, and I mentioned the wraparound supports, they also include things like extended learning time, uh, after school, before school, in the summer, where we can take advantage of learning recovery opportunities if we structure that time productively, as well as a variety of enrichment opportunities that make kids excited about coming to school. Um, the uh, supports that include social and emotional supports for students so they feel attached to and connected to school, um, the health programs and social services. So uh, creating environments where uh, we know that we can find a way to meet all of students' needs not only helps improve student learning, it helps improve teacher retention as well because teachers then get the additional resources for their students that allow them to uh, be effective in their teaching. Uh, we are seeing more and more state investments in community schools all across the country because of the effects of the pandemic and the recognition that these supports really make a difference in student engagement, attendance, and, uh, per, and achievement. Uh, California, perhaps the largest with $4.1 billion, but also New Mexico, Illinois, New York, Georgia, Vermont, Maryland, Florida, and others that are now considering uh, this kind of a an investment. Uh, we're seeing states increase the level of support, prioritize funding uh, for the highest need schools, uh, using evidence-based strategies so that the implementation is effective, and then investing in technical assistance so that the work is productive. 
Now we know something about the policies that drive state achievement differences. Uh, the, this chart shows a pre-pandemic uh, ratings of states. You can see uh, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Vermont, and Connecticut at the top of the rankings in eighth grade reading. Uh, and at the bottom, Louisiana, California, Mississippi, and Washington, D.C. Uh, Post-pandemic in 2022, we actually see that um, New Jersey has climbed to be number one in the country in eighth grade reading. That's that little uh, red number with a star next to it. Uh, and that uh, California has climbed to meet the national average. Uh, and there are real stories around the funding strategies that were used in these states that I'm going to talk about in my um, next uh, remarks. So what are the investment strategies that made a difference for student learning? This uh, report that you saw there, Investing for Student Success, uh, tells the stories in some detail of several of the states I'm gonna talk about. One of them was Connecticut, one of the first uh, major initiatives back in way, in, way back in 1987, uh, where they equalized funding primarily by raising and equalizing teacher salaries and uh, salaries for uh, school leaders as well. And they did that on an equalizing basis. So as uh, districts got to their uh, minimum salary, uh, the, they got more if they were a lower wealth, uh, higher poverty district. They raised standards for teacher education entry and professional licensing at the same time, so that as they were able to buy more teachers as, you, as uh, the salaries went up, they were also able to improve the quality of teaching. Uh, that included mentoring, there were performance assessments for beginning teachers, they put a lot of resources into principals' abilities to support instruction. And they were doing the same thing with principal mentoring and um, performance assessments and then teaching them how to support teachers as a key aspect of the principal's job. They put a lot of resources into professional development and reading, writing, math, and science. They developed standards and assessments that were really focused on higher level thinking and student performance and problem solving. And when they did all of these things, uh, you can see that this is the chart for uh, fourth grade reading. Uh, in a very short period of time, their uh, achievement went up over the course of that next decade to be number one in the country, not only in reading, but in math, science, writing, uh, and really uh, buoyed them to the top rankings of states where they have um, mostly stayed ever since, uh, although they've had some regression in the way that their formula operates, they have maintained most of those kinds of investments. Massachusetts followed uh, after Connecticut early in the 1990s. They had a major reform in 1992 with a new formula that was weighted by student needs. So depending on the student need, including poverty and um, uh, special education and other needs like that, uh, districts got more money, so it was a very progressive formula. They invested in preschool and healthcare for children at the same time. They raised standards, as Connecticut had, for teaching and for teacher education. Uh, they established student standards. Again, they used high-quality, open-ended assessments of critical thinking skills. Uh, they did a lot around school redesign, and then they stayed, as Connecticut did, uh, in that groove with the same policies for more than 15 years. They did that uh, in both states with bipartisan commissions that were established to come together and create a consensus reform uh, with participation from the business community, uh, from the uh, community of parents and uh, of advocates in the state, et cetera. And then they were able to really stay the course. And that's a critical aspect of reforms that work. I'm trying to get this to move to the next one. There we go. You can see how uh, state funding went up in Massachusetts. That's that top line, the gray line. And basically uh, state funding almost tripled uh, between um, 1995 and 2005. Uh, and then it has bounced around in that um, area uh, since then. So that then uh, eliminated many of the disparities uh, in funding um, wealth that uh, exist between and among the towns uh, in Massachusetts. And we find this in many states where uh, the little 
uh, towns and um, uh, districts, you have very different capacity. New Jersey is the story that is an interesting one. Uh, they came online with their reforms after Massachusetts. They began in 1998. They had 30 years of school finance reform lawsuits, nine different court cases asking the state to equalize spending between and among the districts. Uh, finally, in 1998, it was Republican Governor Christy Todd Whitman who uh, created uh, with the legislature the parity funding formula for high need districts that brought them up to the level of the uh, sort of top 100 districts in the state in terms of funding. Uh, they put in place high quality preschool, but for both three and four year olds, it turns out that those two years of high school of preschool make a very big difference in achievement. Uh, they again did curriculum and assessments focused on uh, performance skills, thinking skills, open-ended assessments. Uh, they put in place strong bilingual education and put in place bilingual uh, li libraries in all of the um, preschool and elementary school classrooms. Uh, what we know is that when that's done well, it actually promotes stronger literacy um, in both languages, but um, in English as it's uh, evaluated later uh, over time that they made similar teacher and leader uh, learning investments, and then they did engage in whole school reform models, including the Comer model, uh, which was one of those that uh, supported some of the greatest gains, which really personalizes instruction around a developmental framework for children that all the adults come to understand how children develop and then work together to make sure that they're supporting um, children's learning and behavior in uh, consistent, coherent ways. New Jersey, uh, of course, uh, those reforms led to major improvements in achievement, uh, major closing of the achievement gap. There was a moment, uh, this is the first decade, you usually see these gains in achievement over that first decade of reforms. There was a moment at the end of that period of time where the average Black and Hispanic student in New Jersey outscored the average student in California, which was disinvesting in education at the same time. Uh, and as of 2022, um, this majority minority state with 60% students of color, 40% of students low income, uh, was first in the country in eighth grade reading, in eighth grade writing, third tied for third in math, but first also uh, in high school graduation tied with Iowa. So uh, major improvements um, that demonstrate that it's not who the students are, but what the support system is that really makes a difference in the long run. And finally, California, I had flagged earlier uh, because of its very strong gains in very recent years, uh, put in place something called the local control funding formula, uh, which sharply increases spending uh, not only uh, based on uh, low-income students, English learners, foster care, homeless student designations in a weighted formula, but when there are 55% or more of those students in a district, the amount of money that comes uh, allocated for those uh, needs is greater. And you can see this um, very sharp um, increase in expenditure uh, over the recent years as the formula has come online. Uh, that came, by the way, uh, into being at a time when California had been cutting budgets for many, many years. It was one of the lowest spending states in the nation, one of the lowest achieving states in the nation. And there wasn't new money on the table right away, but as the new money was able to come in with some other reforms, uh, it was then allocated in these new ways. And we see that uh, from a recent study by Rucker Johnson, uh, you can see the improved reading and math achievement, which is really especially tied to the amount of money that's come in through that concentration grant formula. Uh, and we also see increases in um, the high school graduation rate, especially for children from low income families uh, during this period of time as well. Uh, one of the other things we see in California as uh, resources have been coming in uh, on the basis of this formula is uh, during the pandemic, like everyone else, there was some drop in uh, achievement that is the students who were tested in 2022 uh, were uh, at a lower level of achievement uh, than those in 2019 on the state tests. Unlike other states on the national assessment of educational progress, California did not fall backwards in eighth grade reading. Uh, and fell backwards less in math than others on average. 
But what we found in looking at the data is that between 2021 and 2022, the rate of improvement in achievement for the students who were tested in those two years was much stronger, much steeper than it had been in the pre-pandemic years. So students are learning at a faster rate, at an accelerated rate. Um, and we want to understand what's causing that. The same thing was true for English learners. You can see this sharper increase in 2021 to 2022 uh, for those learners. Uh, and we think about the possible underpinnings for that, which include, in addition to the formula that I described, the fact that there was a huge investment in uh, computer devices and connectivity to try to close the digital divide, uh, big investments in community schools with the wraparound services, mental health supports, uh, almost all districts getting access to expanded learning time funding for summer uh, school, and nine out of 10 districts did offer summer school in the last several years and after school. Learning recovery funding uh, for tutoring and other forms of intensive accelerated learning, and then uh, investments in teacher recruitment to solve shortages, uh, development, and retention. So when we put that all together, let's see if we can make this slide move. Uh, we're really aiming for a new anatomy of equity in which we really get in place the supports for children, the food, housing, uh, academic, as well as social supports, uh, equitable school resources uh, tied to pupil needs, uh, well-prepared and well-supported educators uh, moving towards this 21st century curriculum and assessment system uh, that hopefully at the end of the day will produce the innovative and effective schools that we need for whole child education. And with that, I'm going to introduce uh, my uh, colleague, Dan Thatcher, who is a senior fellow at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and he is going to introduce our wonderful panel. Dan? Thank you so much, Dr. Darling Hammond. I appreciate the informative, thorough uh, excuse me, presentation. I uh, do have some news today that one of our panelists unfortunately had a medical emergency, will not be able to join us today. That is uh, Representative Will Davis. Um, just unfortunate, he's a great guy, has long been involved in the education finance reforms in Illinois and, and has a great amount of information to share. Um, so our hearts go out to him and his family. Um, but for now, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our moderator, Renee Blahuda. Uh, Renee is a program officer at the Kellogg Foundation. She works in the area of early childhood education and education systems. Renee's works uh, supports efforts nationwide that focus on effective teaching practices and systems level improvement through attention to equitable allocation of education resources. Renee's work in the foundation is informed by her 15 years of experience in Chicago public schools, serving as an elementary school principal, an assistant principal, a professional development leader, and a middle school science teacher. I am so uh, amazed at middle school teachers. Um, as, as well as her work in uh, business and as a lawyer. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos. Uh, Representative Santos was elected to the Washington State House of Representatives in 1998. Representative Santos chairs the House Education Committee on which she has served for 25 years. She also serves on the Finance Committee and Consumer Protection and Business Committee and serves appointments to the Washington State Education Opportunity Gap Accountability an oversight committee, the Legislative Oral History Committee, and the Public Stadium Authority and Advisory Committee. A graduate of Evergreen State College and of Northeastern University, Representative Santos has worked in the banking industry, on staff to local public elected officials, and in senior management positions for nonprofit organizations. She represents the most diverse legislative district in the state and is the longest serving member of color to serve in the Washington State Legislature. Um, and both uh, Representative Davis and uh, Representative Santos are fellows in the Education Finance Fellowship, which is a joint program run by NCSL and LPI, Learning Policy Institute. The Education Finance Fellows Program brings together legislators and legislative staff from nearly two dozen states to build their knowledge of school finance research and policy and to share policy strategies to address school funding inequities, opportunity gaps, 
and other pressing issues in their states. And with that, I will turn it over to Renee. Um, I should also mention too that I will try to answer some uh, questions and provide some insight uh, where I uh, have some, some knowledge and, and insight into as well in these different topics. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Dan, uh, for um, the lovely introduction and also for uh, pitching in with your uh, deep insights as well. And I see Dr. Um, Darling Hammond uh, also on screen, uh, who I believe will also be available to uh, lend her insights during uh, some of our panel discussion here uh, as well. And uh, welcome again, Representative Santos. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today. It's really wonderful to have you here, uh, given your extensive experience um, as a legislator working toward uh, making sure resources are invested both equitably and efficiently. Uh, to support student learning uh, in your state. So uh, really a pleasure to, to have you here and really looking uh, forward to doing a bit of a deep dive uh, into kind of the state of play in uh, your state of Washington uh, as we start our conversation here today. Um, so I'm hoping, uh, if you would, that you could start us off today uh, by offering a sense of what the uh, educational context is uh, kind of in this moment in Washington uh, when it comes to the state of funding and resources available for schools. And um, if you could tell us a bit about how your state has really taken steps to invest educational resources uh, more equitably and efficiently in ways that really support uh, the whole child. So I'd love to turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Renee. And uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dr. Darling Hammond, for inviting me to participate uh, with all of you. I always jump at every opportunity to uh, work with both NCSL and L LPI, um, both organizations helping to really inform deeply the work that we uh, do in the state of Washington in a variety of ways. Uh, Renee, you asked a very important question about sort of what is the fi financial or funding context here in the state of Washington, and I think um, it's best if I start with a little bit of a look back um, to uh, where we've been uh, in the state, and um, I won't go too far back, I'll go as far back as 2012. Um, because uh, that is when um, the uh, state uh, was sued uh, for lack of adequate funding for um, public education in, in our state. Uh, it took multiple years for that lawsuit uh, first to come forward. Um, the uh, Supreme Court did rule that the state was not adequately meeting our constitutional obligation. And most of our states have some sort of constitutional requirement to fund education. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to understand what is the nature of your state's unique constitutional uh, duty and obligation. In the state of Washington, what the Supreme Court de deemed is that um, our, because the Constitution uh, lays education uh, and ample uh, uh, provision of education in our state as a paramount duty, the uh, Supreme Court ruled that above all other considerations, our state has the duty uh, to fully fund uh, and amply fund uh, education. The other unique thing in this lawsuit that I think just bears mentioning because uh, it might be one of those um, unique elements of our particular suit is um, the uh, court, upon making this ruling, uh, retained jurisdiction over uh, the um, process of moving towards full funding, which took about, uh, well, from 2012 to 2018, uh, about six years, to uh, have the courts finally deem that the legislature had fully funded education. Um, that meant we put in a huge amount of state funds, primarily in the um, uh, 
in the uh, uh, teacher compensation box, uh, because again, as the uh, court ruled, uh, you cannot have um, adequate education without a qualified teacher teaching that class. So they clearly made that connection. Um, that did put us in a little bit of a strange box later on uh, when um, the federal government then passed um, some new rounds of funding uh, during CARES where they also put rules and uh, restrictions around both equitable and, um, Dan, I'm gonna ask you to help me out. There are two conditions. One was equitable funding and the other was um, the um, ongoing maintenance. Uh, of, of funding because we had put so much new money into education, it actually disproportionately changed the uh, percentage of state funds that went to, say, for example, higher education. Um, so those are uh, interesting uh, little elements. Um, it looks like Dr. Darling Hammond wanted to jump in and say something. Oh, okay. No, um, no, so we go right ahead. Okay. So, um, so where we are in terms of fully funding, and I will use quotation marks because um, as an individual lawmaker, I might um, take a little bit of exception to the courts deeming us fully funding because we did not solve the special education funding. We did not touch that in our McCleary um, solution. We also did not touch uh, the issue of pupil transportation. So those are outstanding issues that, uh, and in the role of special education following the big pandemic, we are grappling with a crisis in funding uh, special education in Washington state right now. But I think the bottom line is, and I'll wrap up with this, is um, we, uh, we formerly had been funding um, K-12 education at greater than 50%. That was before uh, the McCleary funding. And now both with the size of our investments, um, we are uh, actually sort of, uh, the, the amount of money proportionately that is going to K-12 education is actually now less than 50%. And part of that has to do with the influx of federal dollars. So we're in this really strange um, sort of place today uh, in trying to move forward with how are we going to sustain public education when we have all of these new challenges that are related to the pandemic and to recovering from the pandemic that have to do with increasing shortages in our educator workforce uh, and that have to do with um, longstanding pre-pandemic um, dysfunction in the way that we actually fund. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for starting us off with, with some of that context. And we're gonna talk about, I think the, the federal funding in, in a moment in a bit more detail. Um, Appreciate also the the nod towards uh, deep investment in uh, teacher workforce, right? As a big component uh, uh, of the work uh, that that has been done, uh, and also would love to turn it over uh, to Dr. Darling Hammond for a moment. I think you wanted to jump in on a piece a piece there, so you know, please. And then uh, uh, Dan would love to uh, offer you an opportunity there to to round out. Uh, so please, Linda. Well, yeah, I, I was really just nodding in response to the representative's comments, but I will say that the point that she raises around special education is one that I think all of us, many of us are really needing to think about because it's not only the amount of money going into special education, uh, and of course the federal government you know, for years has not met its uh, commitment to the 40% that it promised to uh, put in, and then states have been trying to make up all of the difference. Uh, but the other thing is that um, we've got to figure out how to spend that money in productive ways for children. And there's a huge teacher shortage across the country in special education. And uh, certainly we're experiencing it in California. You may not may or may not have as much of that experience in Washington, but it's pretty generalizable. And uh, getting highly, highly skilled and expert teachers in that area is what kids most need. Right. Um, you know, they most need, uh, you know, teachers who really, I mean, this is very complicated 
uh, often medical as well as psychological as well as educational knowledge that we need to be supporting uh, children well. Um, and we end up often with underprepared teachers, uh, then that leads to, you know, uh, ask, parents asking for a variety of other services, including uh, a one-on-one -on -one aid and so on, which can sometimes be uh, absolutely necessary. But sometimes if we had special education uh, teaching structured in more productive ways, uh, kids would be making better progress uh, along the way. And so we have a major school funding uh, and school design challenge. And I just want to reinforce your intention to get back to that and say that we will happily join with you in, in problem solving because it's a, it's a very important issue across the country. Thank you. Um, I'll add that um, just by way of a little anecdote, while Washington was going through that litigation. The, the same court levied a $135,000 fine per day that each day that the, the legislature was out of compliance, the fine was levied on the, on the legislature. That's just a little anecdote. More importantly, I will say that before the pandemic, one of the most frequent questions we fielded at NCSL, and, and by the way, we, we field questions from state legislators and legislative staff all over the country, um, and we, we are bipartisan nonpartisan really and um try to provide as objective information as we can so when we fill these questions we we're really giving a, a good landscape of the uh to to legislators of the the research field and what other states are doing so uh the question that we did receive in terms of education finance was what it was that um in the funding formulas they could do to direct resources to low-income students students who need resources more and part of this came about because of changes in the, the free and reduced price lunch law, the federal law, um, mm -hmm. and the transferring over to the, the community eligibility provision. That changed the way that states identified uh, districts for additional resources. Mm -hmm. But I, why I bring this up is that um, earlier in Dr. Darling Hammond's presentation talking about the need to direct resources is critical to, to where they're needed most. This really was one of the biggest uh, questions that we received from state legislatures is how do we, in our funding formula, what is the mechanism to get these funds to where they're needed? And that work um, really got amplified during the pandemic as, as needs grew and, and trying to hone that, that part of the funding formula. So typically um, that is the part of the funding formula that will identify a, an, a, weight, a weight to a student or to a district with concentrations of poverty. Um, additional weighting, weighted funding to those, those students and districts. The other part of that, though, that we're getting into now is um, back to this question of uh, how the money is spent and the, the importance of that. We're getting hearing from legislators. Well, we're advocate, we're, we're um, adding additional resources for, for these districts and for these students, but we don't know that it's being spent on them or how it's being spent on them. And that gets into this this difficulty in funding formulas between accountability on one end and fungibility of funds in the districts on the other end. So that we want districts to be able to use these additional resources in a way that they believe and they know will work well. And also some accountability for legislators to know that these additional resources are actually being spent wisely um, and effectively on the students they're, they're meant for. And those are uh, just two of the big trends that we're seeing in, in terms of education finance funding formulas at the state level. Yeah, I appreciate kind of those both sides of that coin uh, and also would add in two uh, issues uh, have been trending too about transparency of reporting, right, just about getting access to data, right, around what is uh, actually, you know, occurring. Um, Representative Santos, if I may, like, turn it back to you kind of around this issue of um, of uh, kind of getting the right funding, right, to the right students and the right places. Um, and so when we, you know, historically have thought about educational resources and state budgets, and I think still currently, right, a lot of that funding uh, seems to often be siloed, right, and siloed in ways that um, are inefficient and difficult to access for families. They may look good kind of on paper, right, in a spreadsheet version. It's very, um, very clear kind of where the money is coming from and what purposes it's to be used from, for. Uh, but, you know, students and their families have needs that are interconnected. Uh, and so getting access to those streams of funding uh, gets uh, um, 
uh, a little bit uh, less clear in real life, uh, especially since um, you know that um, siloed nature of the funding can really impact students' opportunities to learn if you can't get it, right? right. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how Washington is working to break down some of those funding silos to better serve young people? Um, and then, um, you know, that's kind of the mechanics piece, I think. And then simultaneously kind of how um, the state might be working to more intentionally um, increase collaboration, right, among stakeholders. Um, so across agencies, kind of internal stakeholders in the state, and then um, interest groups uh, and stakeholders who are um, in schools, attending them, you know, running schools. Um, so that needs of the whole child and, and families are met. Right. Well, uh, thank you for that question. And I do, I think I'll, I will start by um, pinning myself to one of the things Dan just talked about, which is that balance between um, uh, both the uh, local control aspect, recognizing that we have a philosophical belief system that those who are closest to the problem or closest to the service that's being delivered should be the ones who are deciding the what's of the services being delivered um, and to what extent, as well as um, then the tension it has with accountability. And I wanted to just give one little example of uh, a uh, innovation that we uh, developed in our budget last year. And I think it still remains to be seen if it was effective, but um, in our uh, funding for formula, which is the prototypical school funding formula, and of course it goes out on an allocation basis. So our funding formula may say that for every 500 student uh, elementary school building, we expect to have 28 certificated staff and X number of classifieds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whether or not the district spends it that way is totally a district decision. But with the pandemic really highlighting the need for more school counselors, more health professionals like school nurses, which are in very, very short supply, uh, the need for more mental health counselors in particular in our school buildings, short of trying to get and mandate a, sing a mental health counselor in every building, um, what we ended up was putting a new um, addition into the budget that we called sort of the mental health, social, emotional learning box. And we added a little percentage there, but we also uh, required that that little box could only be spent on those professions. Um, I think part of the challenge there is that um, uh, it is uh, a swipe at local control but it is also trying to get more money and get greater accountability. So the reports that you referenced, Renee, are very important. And, but the question becomes, what is the data that the legislature needs and um, where is it coming from? So one of the examples that I think uh, Dan also raised was on uh, the new federal CEP program, uh, which we are, we made an effort to go 100% in the state, we, we scaled way back. Um, so we've covered probably about two thirds of the students, 1.1 million students in the state of Washington. We are after this legislative session going to be covering about two thirds. And so I'm feeling very, very good about that. But here's the challenge. Um, we have built so many of our um, special programs designed to aid students who are struggling to aid students who are poor on the uh, free and reduced lunch status. And when we don't collect that information anymore, all of the other systems fall apart. And so we're having a systems breakdown by moving towards what one would argue, I would certainly argue, is a very good public policy, which is universal meals provided by our schools. Some of the other um, ways in which we've tried in Washington state, I'm going to talk about um, a statutory group we created called the Educational Opportunity Gap Oversight and Accountability Committee, which is too long to say, so we just call it the EOGOAC. 
And I think Jen's going to drop a little uh, link into um, the chat box uh, about our latest report. In uh, 2019, I think it was, uh, we, maybe it was earlier than that, we uh, put together omnibus legislation to cover many of the aspects that we heard from students of color and their families were barriers to their children's education um, that ran from everything from uh, lack of a diverse workforce to uh, inadequate cultural competency training to uh, disproportionate discipline um, uh, and on and on and on. And I think there's two things that I think are uh, germane to this conversation. One is on data. Uh, in Washington state, we require all schools, uh, K-12 public schools, to report um, disaggregated data in a very small, we have an uh, end count of uh, 10, um, by uh, ethnicity as uh, deemed in the federal census, and we included several. So for example, in Washington state, we have several federally recognized tribes. So we include each of those tribes and we're asking for data so that we can start pinpointing uh, again, what strategies are working, what, what strategies are not, what students are in trouble, what students are not. Um, so that's one thing when we talk about data is we need to have more specific data. Um, the other thing is we adopted the Washington Integrated Student Support Protocol, and this was really much more a nod to our local partners around the local control. So we've said that the Learning Assistance Program, which is our additional funding for struggling students, of course, driven out by poverty, i.e. free and reduced lunch, um, historically, uh, that was supposed to have been the um, most or least restricted uh, funding, but over year, the years, of course, it became more restrictive, especially during the known child left behind when we started saying, oh, no, it has to go to fourth grade reading. No, it has to go to, uh, you know, these types of assessments. We said we're going back to no restrictions, your decision, as long as you use the Washington Integrated Student Support Protocol, which starts with an assessment of student need and moves then to an assessment of resources in the community. Who can you bring in to your school that can deliver on some of those uh, services that your students need? And um, then going through, of course, the public budgeting process at the school district level. And finally, collecting data to ensure that the decisions that you have made locally with those dollars are actually moving the needle for the students that are delivering those do dollars to your district. I know that was a lot, sorry. Well, I, I'd love to add on if that's okay. Um, please, please. A lot of great issues that you've brought up. You know, one of them is around, you know, how do we uh, allow local communities to spend money in ways that are productive for them and still have accountability? The question Dan started with, and I think uh, California is doing some very similar things uh, one is that um, the local control funding formula eliminated a lot of small categorical programs and folded them into that money and said, you, know, you decide how to spend it. However, it was accompanied by local control accountability plans that local districts put in place to say, we've taken a look at our students. We've taken a look at our progress on the eight state priorities, which include you know, do we have a rich curriculum? What kind of outcome data do we have around college and career and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, attendance and so on. And then made a plan with the community to spend money to meet those needs. Uh, and that gets re-upped every three years. So it's a an alternative to the, you know, micromanagement from the state capital saying you must spend this little amount here and that amount there, which then, of course, also means that districts have to hire a lot of people sort of wearing green eye shades to track the money rather than hiring, you know, teachers and, and others who are working directly with students. Um, so that helps with some of it. And in fact, the first report that was done on by one of our economists on um, the local control funding formula was called Money and Freedom. And it was looking at how the freedom and the money allowed for the effects that were being found. 
Uh, but there's more on the siloing as well. You mentioned you know, taking a needs assessment of students and the community and so on. We're doing some of that in the community school initiative where that's the first thing you have to start to do. So, because there's so much money coming at schools right now from the federal government, from state mm -hmm. governments for this, for that service, for tutoring, for mentoring, for mental health. If you don't have somebody at the school level integrating that and actually organizing it to meet the needs of children, families and schools cannot take yeah. advantage of all these little different pieces of siloed money. So I also think we can help at the at the ground level by you know creating uh, ways that schools and districts can you know uh, use tools like community schools to integrate. But we have a responsibility at the state level, and I think there's a responsibility at the federal level to start to de-silo the way in which we you know manage money to put in place children's cabinets and other strategies where we're cooperating and collaborating across agencies, uh, because it's really very difficult for mm -hmm. folks, particularly in little tiny school districts, to manage all of the complexity of these funding streams. So I just really appreciated your, your point on that. I put in the chat for anyone who's interested, you, you and Dan both mentioned also the um, difficulty of knowing what the socioeconomic status of a school is to direct money to it when the free and reduced price lunch data are no longer eligible. So we had a little a publication on that that I put in the chat in case it's helpful to folks who are trying to sort out other ways to um, develop indicators. Appreciate all of those examples and just this constant issue that's arising around like basically design challenges that are arising uh, and solvable right, uh, due to good policy changes uh, that, you know, are uh, are occurring. Um, so really, really appreciate that. Um, and this concept too, I'm, I'm hearing, right, around trade-offs, right, that are involved, right? You're unlocking access, but like, you know, the trade, some of the trade-off is like there is a person, for example, a personnel cost, right, uh, in the the coordination that's needed, you know, in, in uh, to be able to, to do that. Um, Representative Santos, quick question for you before we kind of um, move into the, um, kind of federal COVID uh, relief fund space, uh, because uh, some questions around that. Um, I think you mentioned, um, you know, early learning uh, as also an area uh, of interest in Washington. Can you speak mm -hmm. a little bit about um, kind of uh, any kind of breaking down of silos there uh, in terms of funding or just uh, other ways that you all are looking at that in, in Washington? That's an area that often comes up uh, as, as people are thinking about, um, you know, making that more uh, accessible to families in the way that they use um, kind of both early, you know, early childhood ed and then kind of traditional K-12, which is increasingly becoming pre-K-12 uh, yeah. learning. Right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, to try and be um, as succinct as possible, um, a, a, another um, uh, problem that was clearly made even more uh, highlighted during the pandemic is our shortage of high quality early learning facilities, child care centers, and um, how much we depended on them during the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and we continue to as people are trying to go back to work. Um, our uh, school districts, and I really do believe our local school districts often are, we, we call the states, you know, the, the, um, the experiments of democracy, uh, but uh, our local school districts are really where innovation is driven from necessity. Um, and they, uh, school districts partnered with many of their early learning providers, whether they are uh, the uh, federal um, uh, program, or we have a state-based uh, early childhood education assistance program, ECAP, um, and with our private child care providers to say, um, we know that early childhood education is necessary. We know there's not enough capacity in our community. Is there a way that we can partner together? Well, there happened to be a small loophole in one of our statutes that allowed a program to blossom that has actually, um, the early adopters have pro provided this invaluable service in their communities by working very closely and cooperatively with the local 
early childhood providers often braiding uh, K-12 dollars with federal dollars with um, uh, state ECAP dollars and also including private providers. As that program has grown, um, it's starting to um, uh, be more of a threat to the early learning community insofar that um, it's become a program all of its own, taking many four-year-olds out of the ECAP system, which if you've ever operated a nonprofit or a for-profit small business for early learners, you need those four-year-olds to keep the business intact. So right now we are trying to develop legislation that keeps an equilibrium between private providers and our uh, schools, especially where we have childcare deserts. And um, it's been a very difficult piece of legislation to, to you know, wind through, through the system. Uh, but one of the things that we recognize is on our road in Washington to universal early learning and where um, ECAP becomes an entitlement program in our state by 2026, uh, we have to be able to protect uh, the providers in that space and ensure that uh, the providers of our K-12 system are working nicely as they're starting to um, create new programs where they haven't existed before. But it is very exciting because we are seeing a partnership uh, flourish uh, between our traditional K-12 systems and our early learning providers. Little bit of a maybe a shotgun marriage in some cases, but um, it started off very, very organically. And so we're hoping we can see it replicate throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you for that more detailed look into, into that piece of that uh, the de-siloing. Um, you know, we're we're close to nearing, you know, the end of our time. And I'm, I'm hoping you could kind of round out the conversation with um some thoughts about how the federal COVID relief funds, right, um, have uh allowed, you know, your state of Washington to meet needs, right, of the whole child. And um maybe one or two challenges, biggest challenges that uh those that funding stream has uh, has posed. And then I think really on the back end ask, do you have, if you could offer one piece of advice uh, to other state leaders who are looking to invest both, you know, efficiently, but also equitably uh, in whole child um, work, education support, learning support, you know, what should they keep in mind? Well, thank you, Renee. That's uh, an excellent question. Um, I, th I think it's important uh, from my standpoint to recognize that um, uh, COVID, uh, while a very huge challenge, um, really made us as uh, policy leaders and um, our partners, on uh, the practitioners on the ground, really rethink about how do we do school? I mean, we are so stuck in this 19th century model of delivering educational uh, services. And uh, we saw how poorly we all fared uh, during COVID with this model. And so um, one of the things, uh, we changed the way we looked at um, how do we do school. And whereas uh, all of our previous policies are about how do we get the child to school to receive these services, we started seeing with COVID assistance, the need and the ability to bring school to the child, whether that meant bringing homework packets, whether that meant uh, bringing uh, Wi-Fi, whether that meant sending out social workers. Uh, the last, uh, the other thing I would say is um, one of the problems that we had in the COVID funds is that um, it, almost every legislature, Dan can correct me, I think is the funding source for the state budgets. And funding from the um, Congress bypasses the legislature. It went to the governors and it went to uh, the SEAs. 
uh, that makes it very difficult for state legislators to get an understanding of how are these funds going to be deployed, having to push ourselves into the room of where there are decisions. And so my piece of advice to uh, other policymakers is, um, one, get to know your, your documents, your organic documents, two, uh, work with NCSL and LPI, and three, be persistent. Stage advice. Thank you, Representative Santos, Dr. Darling Linda Hammond, and uh, Dan Thatcher. Let's give a round of applause virtually um, to our amazing panelists. Thank you all so much. And I think that note to end on, we really do need to um, rethink the way we do school. Um, and I think we'll all walk away from this conversation reflecting on what that means for ourselves and our context and our state policies. I wanna thank our co-sponsors, um, the School Superintendents Association, the National Conference of State Legislatures and the Sold Alliance. Um, this is the fifth um, in our six part webinar series. So um, I encourage you to register for number six, which is May 24th. It will focus on how states can redesign curriculum, instruction, assessment, and accountability for whole child design. Um, and if before you leave, you wouldn't mind filling out a survey that will pop up in the chat for you. We're always trying to get better at what we do through uh, these virtual learning opportunities. Thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you in May.